couple of weeks ago, I put a post on LinkedIn. Nothing particularly unusual in that. But I spent a few days actually thinking about what I wanted to say and whether, in fact, I should say it at all. What I was sharing was that I just accepted a volunteer position with Woods Homes on their board of directors. So pretty normal career type stuff. But what I shared was that it actually had a very personal connection for me, because if you don't know, Woods Homes is a local not-for-profit that does amazing work with youth that are struggling with mental health. They have community programs. They have all kinds of uh, really good stuff to help out kids that are struggling. And my own son has been a client of Woods Homes for five odd years. And I shared just a little bit about why that was so personal to me, a little bit about that story. He's been hospitalized roughly 15 times. I've had the police, emergency services, had to come to my house and help him on a number of occasions. In fact, I've been on Teams calls early on in the pandemic where I had to change my background rather hurriedly because unknown to me, the police had had to come while I was working and help him out. And I've had a younger son that's, you know, heartbreakingly had to lock himself in the bathroom and call 911, you know, more times than you'd ever want that to happen. Now, you're probably thinking you came to the wrong presentation, right? You're supposed to be talking about innovation. Well, there's a reason I'm sharing this story with you, and it's because of what happened the next day. I had a lot of people actually reach out to me and share some of their stories. That's something that happens when you do that. People open up and they want to tell you about their stuff, which is really kind of humbling to hear. But the next morning, I went into work, and one of my managers came up to me as I was just getting into the office and asked if he could have a minute. And I, of course, I said, I said, sure. And we, we went into my office. And with very clear emotion on his face, he just told me how much he, wanted, he appreciated that post. And he appreciated it, he said, because it made him feel safe. It made him feel like he was at a place where ideas could be safe, where having different opinions could be safe. And so I want to ask you, because for the next 17 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how innovation is actually a mindset, and it's about our behaviors. What are we doing, all of us collectively, to make it safe so that people can share their ideas? Because that will have more to do with your success than any technology will. At TC, we're trying to do some different things to start the conversation. Take a watch of this. We must continue making progress on the transition to cleaner energy while meeting demand for all the energy we all rely on daily. It's the problem TC Energy is working to solve right here in North America, right now, by modernizing our pipeline network to reduce emissions, cultivating more renewable power, developing new ways to store it, and driving entirely new solutions for capturing and storing carbon, producing cleaner fuels like hydrogen, and taking our infrastructure and making it flex to deliver change. We are restlessly innovative, finding new solutions to move, store, and generate energy, making it sustainable, keeping it secure. We are TC Energy, and we are energy problem solvers. What I like about that video is it's different to what we've seen before. It's a recognition that the conversation is changing. In fact, I would say to all of you, it's a call to action, not just if you work at TC Energy, but if you work in the energy industry, particularly here in Alberta, here in Calgary. Because every company, every industry actually sees this inflection point at some point, this question of whether you're going to renew and continue to grow and be profitable and survive, or whether you're going to descend. And no one's saying that oil and gas is going to go away overnight. No one's saying it's not going to be relevant for many years to come. But how we respond to this question of renewal or descent is going to be key. In 1997, when Steve Jobs goes back to Apple, things are not going well. In fact, Michael Dell tells him that the best thing he can do is to sell everything down to the carpets, give as much money back to shareholders as he can, and call it a day. He doesn't do that. What he does do is take a $150 million investment from their arch enemies, Microsoft. In fact, when Steve Jobs stands up on stage and announces this, he gets booed by his own people. They're so discouraged by what he's doing. But a year later, understanding that they need to renew, he's created the first iMac, the first profitable thing they've done for years. 
And they go on, of course, to put a 1,000 songs in your pocket with the first version of the iPad. They disrupt the music industry forever with iTunes. And of course, they create the iPhone. What's interesting about the iPhone that not everybody knows is that Steve Jobs was adamantly against that. He didn't want a, stuff, a smartphone. He wasn't convinced that they would actually be what they ended up being. And he told investors that Apple wouldn't create a phone because phones suck. Now, I didn't know Steve Jobs personally, but from what I understand, he wasn't the most approachable guy in the world. In fact, he may have skipped a few psychological safety courses that we all go through every year. So how in a company where the boss has said, we're not going to do that, do people go away and covertly work on something, bring him something that he can actually get his head around and change his mind and go on to be a complete disruptor in the phone industry? It's about behaviors. It's about culture. It's about that safety, even with Steve Jobs at the helm, of being able to do it. Contrast that to Toys R Us who, faced with all the competition from Amazon, Target, Walmart, do very little except one thing, they try and sue. And I can tell you that before they set foot in the courtroom, I think we can safely say that they'd already failed. So what's comfortable doesn't stay profitable. And in 2001, two companies are very, very comfortable printing photographs for all of us, and that's, of course, Kodak and Fujifilm. In fact, they're doing so well at this, they can basically give us all free cameras and make their money on the back end of this deal with the printing part, because it's proprietary and it's very, very hard. It's a duopoly. Basically, no one can get in. And in 2001, the market is at its peak, and they're making an absolute fortune. Of course, what happens next is digital. By 2010, the market is down to one-tenth of what it was, and everyone is sharing their, their pictures online. They're not printing anything anymore. right? And the folklore says, well, Kodak failed because they failed to embrace digital. Actually, Kodak, maybe a little late, but they tried very, very hard. They spent billions of dollars trying to capitalize on the digital market. They set up kiosks. They were one of the first to do that, trying to get people to print from digital. But their fundamental mistake was that they wanted to continue making money out of the business the way they had. They wanted to keep doing it out of print. Fujifilm, by contrast, recognizes that the world has irrevocably changed. It's not coming back. And so they start to think in absolutely critical terms of what is it that we're really good at that we could apply our learning and diversify into new businesses. And what they figure out is that what they know about the processes of printing photographs can be applied to your skin. They become a cosmetics company. They go into dermatology in a very big way. They are also keeping an eye on a market that's changing at the same time in the 2000s, which is computer screens and TVs. Everyone's switching from those massive CRTs to these LCD screens. And it turns out that if you're Fujifilm, you're actually pretty good at understanding how to produce images on a screen. And so Fujifilm becomes one of the biggest providers of LCD screens. Fujifilm, even today, doing absolutely fine. Kodak, of course, went bankrupt in 2012. In the early 1900s, Sears revolutionizes retail, and they do it with a book. They put a book on the doorstep of virtually every house in North America that basically puts the big box Sears store right there in the kitchen so the whole family can go through and pick out whatever they need for the house, pick out birthday presents, pick out Christmas presents, without driving hundreds of miles necessarily into a city. They revolutionize retail. They do very, very well. What strikes me about Sears, though, that's interesting, is you substitute the book for the internet, and don't you have the perfect model? How could Sears not be the first out of the gate on that? And the challenge, and we're going to talk about this a couple of times during some of the examples here, is that fear that companies have that the next thing is going to cannibalize what they're already good at, that it's going to cannibalize, in Sears' case, the retail store business that they know very well and that they're doing very well at. And they're not wrong. The problem is that just because you're not willing to do it doesn't mean that someone else won't be. And where people and where companies disrupt is on what other people, what companies are not willing to do. In this room, there's a lot of people that do oil and gas. Not all, obviously, oil and gas, I know that. But if you're in oil and gas, are you really in oil and gas, or are you like Fujifilm, thinking of yourself in energy and what those solutions should be? Companies will disrupt us on that which we're not willing to do. 
And it turns out that if you're a disruptor, the way you think about problems is actually very, very different. So if you're two tech entrepreneurs in 2007, and you've just been to a conference, and you're standing in, in Paris, and by the way, if anyone tells you that Paris is lovely in January, they're not your friend. It's very cold in Paris in January. It's very wet. And these two tech entrepreneurs are standing out on the street in this cold, wet Paris weather in January, and they can't get a taxi. And of course, as entrepreneurs do, they start to think about, well, how could that problem be solved? How could this be that we can't get anyone to take us back to our hotel? They think about limo services. They think about all of those empty seats that are going by in the cars that aren't stopping that they could use. And of course, one of them goes back to California, gets some venture capital, and Uber is born. Now, a lot of people think of Uber and they think, Uber won because of technology. They won because they created a smartphone app and the taxi companies didn't. Uber didn't win because of that. Uber won because of their mindset. They couldn't care less how the business was running today. And they won because they convinced all of us to do something our mothers told us never to do, and that was to get in the back seat, of course, of a stranger's car and let them drive us around town. That was the shift. That was the mindset that they got us into that no one thought they could do. If you're four students in San Francisco in 2000, I think it's 2008, and you're struggling with paying the massive rents, and you see a conference down the road that's totally sold out, and every hotel in town is sold out. If you're a disruptor, you don't think about the hotel business as it is today. You think differently about that problem. And as you probably know, you think about putting air mattresses on your floor and finding out if people will pay you money to stay in your house with you and offer some breakfast, some toast, and coffee in the morning and see what happens. And it turns out people will pay you $80 a night to do that, and you can make some of your rent money. And of course, although it, wasn't, it took four more years for them to get all the funding and convince people that this was a good idea, that's the genesis of how Airbnb was born. So these companies that do this, they get into a different mindset. They're not struck by the tyranny of how. And so as a lot of us in this room work for big companies that have been around for a long time, the fundamental question becomes, how do we become the disruptor and not the disrupted? Having a big balance sheet, having the ability to spend money on things is, is great, but it can also be something that puts the shackles on you that stifle some of the thinking that others will not be limited by. If you're Blockbuster in 2004, life is looking pretty good. Yeah, you know about Netflix. You turn down the opportunity to buy them, but you're making $6 billion a year, mostly off my 20-something self-paying late fees, by the way. But Blockbuster doesn't completely ignore what's happening. They just don't understand how little time they have. They don't understand, fundamentally, how quickly that market is going to shift on them, how it's going to flip. And by the time they try and respond with blockbuster online streaming services and all of that, no one cares. We've all got Netflix accounts. Maybe we need to be thinking a little bit more like Play-Doh. Play-Doh, in case you didn't know, started out as a cleaning product to take smoke residue off of wallpaper in the 1930s. By the 1950s, that wasn't such a big use case for people anymore. People didn't really need to do that. And so what they noticed, they were actually going to shut the company down and kind of take their ball and go home. But what they actually figured out instead, they noticed that teachers were using their product in the classrooms to do arts and crafts with their students. And they rebranded it, of course, as Play-Doh. They ended up selling it to Hasbro. And two billion of those little cups of Play-Doh have now been sold. And multiple kitchen tables have been irrevocably, including mine, damaged forever by these little joys that play with that stuff. So what we've got to think about is how we're going to enable innovation in our own companies. How are we going to disrupt ourselves? And we can look at Amazon for some great examples of how you can do that. So Amazon creates the Amazon Fire Phone, and absolutely none of you buy it. Maybe one of you bought it. But they spent $180 million on the Fire Phone. How is it in a company we would say is one of the most innovative in the world, they can spend $180 million on a flop, on a Fire Phone? Well, it's quite simple, actually. The same process, the same culture, the same lack of fear that allows them to create a Fire Phone creates Amazon Web Services. And Amazon Web Services is their attempt to solve a problem they have in terms of scaling their compute power and their storage internally. And AWS 
What they figure out, of course, is that the problem they've solved for themselves, they can solve for companies like TC. We have all of our infrastructure on AWS today. Last year, AWS made Amazon $18 billion. You can fail on a lot of Fire Phones for $180 million when you're making $18 billion. Amazon understands that what they need is a portfolio. They don't need home runs all of the time. What Amazon understands is they embrace learning. Amazon creates the Z Shop. You've never heard of it, I doubt, because Jeff Bezos famously quipped that only he and his parents had ever been to one. And it was an attempt to take on eBay, creating this ability for all of us to create online marketplaces to sell direct to people. Turns out we didn't want it. But what they learned allowed them to pivot and create Amazon Marketplace. 50% of their e-commerce sales last year were on Amazon Marketplace. So that learning from Z Shops, was it a failure? Amazon embraces that learning. And they also understand that they can't pick winners, that they actually need to allow a portfolio to go ahead. So at TC, we're trying to embrace some of that. We're trying to take on some of those learnings. And what we understand in particular is that we need to split things into an explore portfolio and an exploit portfolio. And the explore portfolio is exactly what it sounds. It's trying to give people oxygen to have good ideas and have those good ideas move forward. There's a famous quote, and I can't remember who it's by, but it's something like, everyone who's had a shower has had a good idea. But it's what they do with it after they towel off that matters. Well, in big companies, what happens next is you get asked to write a 30-page business case that explains exactly how your idea is going to work, exactly how much it's going to cost, exactly what the risks are, when you'll be done, and sign on the dotted line, and you'll get fired if, you, if it fails, right? Well, what we're trying to do in the Explore portfolio is to take away that fear, to give people oxygen to invest in evidence. Is it desirable? Well, we don't know. Let's go find out. Just because you've got a better mouse trap, I may not have a mouse infestation issue, and I may not care. Is it feasible? Is there technology already, or do I have to go create some? That's going to, let's find out. And is it viable? It's a good idea, but it's going to cost you $20 million to solve my $10 million problem. Maybe I don't want to go ahead. Good idea. Let's go back and find another one. So we're trying lots of different ways, like a shark tank internally, to give people the opportunity to come pitch, to come get that little bit of funding, that oxygen, where they can go invest in the evidence without a 30 page business case. That will come later in the exploit portfolio, where we start to see a few things, probably only 20% of the original ideas, come through, take additional funding, and go to the next stage. hundred percent of companies want to be innovative. So I want to leave you with this. hundred percent of companies want to be innovative. I've yet to find one that says, not for us, we think we're going to be fine, we can keep it all the same. But only 5% of companies actually achieve anything through innovation. 95% will get very, very little or nothing. Why is that? Well, you need to be the catalyst. And how do you do that? And I want to leave you with a few thoughts. First of all, be curious. I get into trouble with my people all the time because they say, why can't you just leave it alone? Why isn't it good enough the way it is? Well, if the Apple engineers had had that philosophy, we'd still have the first iPhone. We wouldn't have the iPhone 14. You need to challenge assumptions. Uber could easily have given up by saying, the municipalities are never going to go for this. And the municipalities fought them tooth and nail because they made tons of money out of the existing taxi business. But Uber challenged those assumptions. And as I said to you and I shared with you at the beginning, you're going to have to encourage ideas. You're going to have to have a place where your people feel comfortable and confident bringing you ideas that might just be the next big thing. So. Let's be energy problem solvers. Let's disrupt ourselves. And let's change the future. Thanks for your time.